Carrie, and we'll get underway. So welcome everyone. This is Brene Lloyd from Northwatch, and this is the second in our 2019 Nuclear Waste Online webinar series. Uh, this afternoon, we have Carrie Blaze from the Canadian Environmental Law Association, and she is going to build more detail, much more detail, into one aspect of the Nuclear Waste Management Organization's uh, site selection, site investigation program. In last week's session, the Canada Update, we discuss that in much more general terms, talking about the NWMO's nine-step process. They're in step three. They're exploring uh, uh, areas associated with five different municipalities in the municipalities themselves in southwestern Ontario, in Bruce County, and in surrounding areas for the three municipalities in northern Ontario, Hornpin, Manitowage, and Ignace. So that was a background session, and today we're going to go into more detail uh, with Carrie Blaze, who is Northern Legal Services Council with the Canadian Environmental Law Association. So thank you all for joining us, uh, and thank you, Carrie. Great. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Brene, and thank you, Northwatch, for hosting uh, this annual series because it definitely is a wonderful way for us to all get together and also um, get up to speed on on both like the overview of what's going on and then for today's webinar like the specifics. So um, as Renee mentioned today's webinar we're actually going to drill down on nuclear waste and uh, Renee thought of the very clever title um, and we're going to look at NWMO's exploratory drill program specifically in the northwest so Horn Payne, Ignace Manitowoc. Um, and before I begin if um, if there's any issues with audio, uh, tell me. <laughs> and uh, I will try to watch the chat function or Brene, you can pop up if, if I lose audio or visual. Um, and I'll just, uh, as a word of caution, there's, just for audio purposes, there's um, a snowblower outside at the moment. They're doing snow remediation. And so if the snowblower goes by my window, it gets very noisy. So I will temporarily stop talking. Uh, when it goes by and then I'll start up again when it gets quieter. So, um, okay, so to begin, here is the plan for today. If I can change my slide. Here's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna start by looking at the status of, of the activities in Horn Pay, Manitowoc and Ignace. Um, uh, and then we will be looking at borehole drilling and testing. Like what is that? Uh, what kind of activities are included within that description. Um, so kind of like laying the background. So if you come to this webinar with very little knowledge, um, hopefully we'll all be on the same page. And my apologies if you have been following this closely, either in the news um, or through the NWMO's website. Um, maybe some of it will be repetitive, uh, but we'll be all on the same page. Part two of uh, the webinar, we're going to look at the provincial authorization. So who is the ministry that's overseeing provincially the activities that are going on? So we're not looking at the federal uh, Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission's role in today's webinar. We're looking at the, the provincial authorization specific uh, to drilling and um, the, the exploration that's going on. Part three, I will provide you with all of my resources that I used in making this webinar and presentation. So um, I will make this uh, PowerPoint available through the CELA website. Uh, after. So um, if there's links or notes uh, in, it's in the slides, that will be provided to you after. So don't, don't take too many notes. Um, okay, and the button. So a quick, a quick background. CELA, the Canadian Environmental Law Association, uh, we're a community legal aid clinic and we were founded in the 1970s for the express purpose of providing um, uh, legal aid services to citizens and nonprofits and individuals uh, who are looking to advance environmental protection and the protection of human health generally. Um, I am CELA's, there we go, uh, I am CELA's Northern Services Council, so I am in Northern Ontario at the moment, I'm in Sault Ste. Marie, and this is actually quite a new project for CELA, so we launched it in September. Um, I've been with CELA for about three years now, but uh, only Northern Services Council since, since September. Uh, so as part of this pilot project, we're trying to have a physical presence in the North. Um, while we've never been precluded from working on issues in the North, we're now physically here. So 
Um, I was in North Bay last week and now I'm in Sault Ste. Marie. Um, hence the, the, the snow removal operations. There is a ton of snow in the Sioux right now. So again, um, when the town goes by with their snowblower, I will pause, but we might be on lunch break at the moment. It's actually gotten quite quiet outside. Um, so what we're going to do today. So here we go. The study areas that we're going to look at are pictured on this map. I think you can see my, my mouse, which is kind of helpful. So this map um, highlights the locations that we're looking at. So uh, we're going to look at uh, Ignace, Hornpain and Manitowoc. And perhaps you've seen articles in the news. Um, I, did, I did a screenshot of some, some news articles. So um, drilling has already occurred in Ignace and the NWO has plans for further drilling. So um, it has been in the media. Let me just get some notes here. And for those of you who aren't sure who the NWMO is, so I'll keep using that acronym throughout my presentation. So the NWMO is a nuclear waste management organization, and they were formed um, after the Nuclear Fuel Management Act was passed in 2002. And their mandate is to develop and implement a plan for managing Canada's nuclear fuel waste. Um, they have the mandate to review three management options. And the deep geological repository is one of those three management options for nuclear waste uh, that the NWMO is currently looking at. So that's our focus for today. So in each of these communities, they're all in the same stage. So step three, phase two um, is the official designation. I'll tell you more about that in a second. So what that means is that uh, right now, they are undertaking field activities, uh, and engagement activities. So for the field activities, um, this is comprised of initial field studies, so geophysical surveys, environmental baseline um, studies, and geological mapping. They're also doing intensive field work. So that means detailed studies focused on the specific repository sites um, and the characteristics of those sites and, um, and, and the designated areas. They're also doing engagement activities. So that is another component of step three, phase two. Um, and the engagement activities uh, include outreach with the, the local community, First Nation communities, uh, and surrounding municipalities. Um, and according to the NWMO, this stage, they don't have a set deadline for when they will move out of this phase. They, they don't have uh, an exact completion date on it. It's supposed to be flexible. Uh, and again, this is from the NWMO's website. Um, and if step three, phase two is a little bit uh, theoretical or abstract, just to put it in perspective, uh, just a screenshot again from NWMO's website. So there is a nine step process and we are here in step three. Um, I've only included this just kind of as background information. I'm not going to read through this. And so that, yes, there are nine steps total. So, um, so what does that mean, phase, sorry, step two, phase three, what does that actually look like? So when we look at what's going on in the three communities, um, in Horn Payne, there was permission sought from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry uh, for potential site drilling, and that was to commence in late 2018 or in early 2019. Um, they're already preparing environmental um, uh, characterization study, so collecting that baseline data of the sites. Um, there is an Indigenous engagement report as well. It has not yet been submitted to the MNRF, um, and, and so that consultation is ongoing. And this information, I'll, I provide the resource later in the, in the PowerPoint, but this comes from the meeting minutes of the different uh, community liaison committees that each of the um, Hormian, Ignace, and Manitouage have. Um, so, so if you read through their slides and kind of get a gist of, of more of the details of what's going on. Um, Ignace, so they've already completed hydraulic testing. Uh, they have commenced drilling and the first uh, exploratory hole was drilled in January of 2017. Uh, preparation for additional uh, borehole drilling is currently underway. So, I'm not a, a geologist. I, I do have a master's in science, but I did not 
from a school of geoscience, but I did not study rocks. So this is this is a new area to me. So um, if you, like me, just need a little bit of um, a refresher on what boreholes are and drilling, um, this slide is for us. So um, essentially what is going on, there's a rotary drill rig. Um, it's about 60 meters by 60 meters in, in footprint. So the site is that size, the drill rig sits on top, and they're, they're obtaining rock core samples. So they go down about one kilometer in depth, um, the proposal is that the DGR would be at an approximate de depth of 500 meters, but these uh, rock cores are going down a kilometer. Um, and they're looking for the geophysical, the geomechanical, and the um, hydraulic connectivity of, uh, of the area, the underground area. So, um, so a borehole is a narrow, deep, circular hole uh, that's made in the ground using uh, motorized equipment and um, and you retrieve, I don't have pictures of it here, but you retrieve a, a cylindrical tube, essentially, of rock called a core. Um, there's different ways they test the core. So um, they will have geologists who inspect the core to find out what types of rocks are present, um, as well as what fractures or faults might be present in that area. And again, that's represented in the core sample. Um, they will also take geomechanical uh, tests of that core and that will involve looking at the strength of the rock um, and also uh, geophysical measurements that will look at um, the mineral kind of profile of the core and also the groundwater flow in the area. Um, okay, so having laid that background, so what are they doing? Borehole drilling, where is it happening? Uh, Horn Payne and Ignace. Uh, Manitouaj, uh, supposedly, but not um, not yet. Um, so now I want to look at what is the provincial oversight and the authority for um, these activities that are currently occurring. And before I tell you, I would love for you to just think in your mind or even write down on a piece of paper, if you were doing exploratory activity in the province of Ontario, who do you think would oversee that? Um, so again, you're drilling, you have a, a rig, you have the drill, you have the cores. Um, who do you think might oversee that? So just keep it to yourself and, um, and just for curiosity's sake, maybe I'll ask you uh, at the end of the presentation if we have time. Um, so here we go. So it took a well, not a little, quite a lot of digging. Um, of many documents to find out who actually is overseeing the activities going on. So there was an agreement, which I'll, I'll uh, show a, a screenshot of uh, next, um, that mentioned that authority for the activities is under the Public Lands Act. So this screen shows you uh, section, uh, subsection 2.2 of the Public Lands Act, and it says that the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry may enter into agreements with any person. And on that authority, so under the Public Lands Act of Ontario, um, a memorandum of understanding was entered into between the NWMO, the Nuclear Waste Management Organization, and the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Um, and you can see in this, I've only included an excerpt of the MOU, but in the MOU it states right up front in the preamble that um, it will set out the specifics related to the borehole drilling project. So here's a screenshot of an agreement um, which sets out uh, the terms and the conditions between NWMO and the MNRF as it relates to each individual community. So this one is from IGNACE. And, um, and again, in the preamble, it sets out pursuant to subsection 2.2 of the Public Lands Act, uh, the minister has the authority to enter into agreements with any person uh, for the carrying out of their duties. And, and staying within this agreement for a little bit, um, there are more details as well, and the link to it will be provided to you in the PowerPoint, so um, you can read the full agreement if you so choose uh, later. So in the agreement, so we have the, the broader MOU between the MNRF and, and uh, NWMO. Now this is the agreement I just drew on IGNACE. Um, there is one for horn pain as well, but, but we'll look at the one for IGNACE for now. Um, so it, it defines what is borehole drilling, what is the site, and what is the project. Um, the agreement does have an appendix that sets out uh, a map of the area. So if we look at the definition of borehole drilling site, this includes um, the land, the roads, the trails, the equipment laydown, staffing areas, um, 
And then project is, is slightly more broad. So um, it sets out the necessary activities that are required to determine um, a suitable long-term underground storage facility for Canada's nuclear fuel waste. Um, the agreement also sets out the various responsibilities of uh, the parties. So um, there is a section that says that the NWMO is overseeing the maintenance of the site. Um, and it also talks about what will happen following um, the completion of, of the exploration. So, um, so it says upon the termination or expiry of this agreement, the NWMO, NWMO shall remove all of the improvements, properties or assets from the site. Um, and they have to return it to a clean and safe condition and restore as much as possible. And the agreement also sets out, um, I found this to be probably the more helpful part of the agreement, it actually sets out the specific activities that are going on. Because when you read the news or if you read the NWMO, NWMO's website, uh, it talks about borehole drilling, but it doesn't get into the details. So th this agreement is actually really helpful for that. So. Um, there's, I think, seven or six different activities that it actually um, sets out. So, for instance, core logging, it tells you specifically what this is. So, the core boxes will remain, um, sorry, will be removed off site, uh, processed in a lab for study. Uh, the geophysical well logging, those will um, um, be retrieved from the hole, and one or more tests uh, may be required to determine. Um, um, the, the confluence of it with a radioactive source. It also goes into detail about hydraulic uh, testing. And so, for instance, in this section, it states that um, hydraulic connectivity of the rock at regular intervals down the borehole will be conducted. And similarly, if I move, there we are. So they're also going to do groundwater sampling and testing. Um, and, and they do talk about well sealing, um, and it says at this time, it isn't determined if the borehole will be abandoned, revisited, or um, instrumental for, for further monitoring. So it's kind of left up in the air um, what the status of it is long term. Um, it says that it will be temporarily sealed at the surface between, um, between zones that have differing hydraulic pressures. Um, and it also talks about the site operation. So on site, they say um, on a 24 seven basis during drilling and certain testing operations, there will be workers, um, there will be access to the site. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the agreement between, oh, before I go on. Um, so that's the agreement between the NWO and the MRF. So um, we have two crucial documents, the MOU, uh, which is made pursuant to the Public Lands Act. And then we have this agreement. There's a similar one again for horn paint that kind of sets out the details. Um, and now what I would like to do, having provided that background, we're just gonna pause our discussion about that agreement, the MOU. Um, and, I, and I wanna look at another statute in Ontario that oversees um, a lot of what we're talking about. So exploration, borehole drilling, um, kind of like those early um, exploration activities. So for a moment, just put NWMO, NWMO um, out of mind and let's think about mining. So in Ontario, we have the Mining Act. Um, the Mining Act actually was significantly updated uh, quite recently. So in 2009, Bill 173 was passed and it significantly amended uh, this outdated act that is one of Ontario's oldest statutes, but it had not been amended for quite some time. Um, because of the extent of the amendments, it actually had a, a, a three-phased approach. So phase one came into force first, and it, and it related to um, outreach with private landowners and uh, claim staking, and phase two and phase three came in in 2012 and 2013, respectively. And, um, and it, it pertained to um, new requirements for early exploration uh, activities, which are the exact activities we're looking at right now. So when you do line stripping or cutting or borehole drilling, those are all the early activities that the Mining Act um, sought, to, um, sought to include in its uh, oversight. Um, and the purpose of the Act also changed. So when the amendments came out and it came into force, um, the purpose now states that it's to encourage uh, prospecting and the registration of mining claims um, 
in a way that includes the duty to consult and minimizes the impact of these activities on public health and safety and the environment. So again, just sticking with this Mining Act uh, theme. So under the Mining Act, if you were to engage in early exploration activities like borehole drilling, um, you can go two routes. The first route is a plan and the second route is a permit. And depending upon if you're a plan or a permit, it depends upon if you meet these thresholds. Um, I'm just gonna pause for one moment because I see the chat function is blinking and I just wanna make sure um, that there's no issue, but I lost the chat function. So I'm just going to continue talking because I can't find the chat. Um, so under the Mining Act, um, if the clearing of the land is more than 1.5 meters uh, wide, you need a permit. Um, similarly, if the drill weight of um, the mechanized drill is over 150 kilograms, you need a permit. Um, if your clearance is greater than 100 meters squared, so like the area that you've cleared, you also need a permit. So if you meet any of those thresholds, you need a permit, an exploration permit um, pursuant to the Mining Act. If you don't meet those thresh thresholds, then you um, have a, uh, an exploration plan. And that is submitted to the ministry and the ministry reviews it. And if the plan is of such a nature that they feel that there could be significant uh, environmental or, or health effects, they can bump it up to the permit stage. So the, the Ministry of Northern Development and Mines has the authority to do that. What also accompanies um, either a permit or a plan for early exploration activities are environmental compliance uh, approvals. And maybe some of you are, are familiar with ECAs. So you get ECAs for a number of activities, uh, emissions to air, land, water, um, for noise, uh, for, for sewage works and waste, um, or, or permits to take water. And the ones I, I was researching, what are like the normal or the, the sorry, they're clearing the snow outside my window. Um, so where are the ECAs uh, that are normal for early exploration mining? So air and noise are, are two that are quite common in, in this context. So you get an ECA, um, you do a study first of all to, to monitor the air quality and then see how the proposed project will affect local air quality. And you get an ECA for that. You likewise, you do the same for the noise. So you do um, a prediction of what the noise might be uh, caused by the early exploration activity and, um, and you get an ECA to oversee that. The cool thing about environmental compliance approvals is that you can track them online. So the link on the screen, um, accessenvironment.ene.gov.on.ca, uh, is a map. So you can actually uh, click on the map, look at the ECAs that have been approved in your area, and, uh, um, and it tells you what proponent, what municipality, what government official has been granted what ECA. Okay, so now we're gonna put all of this together. So. Here's a map from, this is for Ignace. Yeah, so this came out of the, it was one of the appendices to the agreement that NWMO and the MNRF have uh, that pertains specifically to Ignace. So this map outlines uh, where the planned borehole site is. So it's where this little pink triangle is. Um, so what I've done is actually overlaid this, so take a look at that map. We have Wabagoon over here, Ignace down here, and now I'm gonna show you a map that plots environmental compliance approvals. So again, this is the map that shows what areas in Ontario have um, ECAs for various emissions to air, land, water. So here's a similar area, and I zoomed out because I didn't wanna miss anything. Ignace is here with the green dots. Uh, Wabagoon is over here, and you'll notice where the, the borehole drilling is occurring, there are no ECAs. There are no um, ECAs that we, that we would see as being typically applied to early exploration uh, activities like borehole drilling. So in the mining context, if this had gone under the Mining Act, there would be ECAs uh, for air, for noise. We're not seeing that. Um, the green dots over here, where I'm circling, I'm hoping you can see my cursor, uh, that is the town of Ignace, and um, I think what's really cool about this map function is you can click on that green dot, the green dot will tell you what the permit is for, what the ECA is for, and it actually brings up the full document. So um, that one in particular, I think, is actually for the municipality, uh, it's, their, their, it's their municipal septic uh, system. 
So another component that I'll point you to, and, and probably many of you are familiar with the Environmental Registry, under the Mining Act, if you were to undertake uh, early exploration activities, which are very similar in nature to the ones that the NWMO is currently undertaking, so the borehole drilling, the hydraulic um, fracturing and studies, um, you would require an exploration permit for that under the Mining Act. Um, and that will get posted to the Environmental Registry. Um, the trouble is, if you remember back about 20 slides, um, the authority for the activities taking place in Ignace and Hornpane um, are not made pursuant to the Mining Act. They're made under the Public Lands Act. And under that act, we don't have the plan or the permit stream. Um, it's not, there's not these triggers. So had the exploration been triggered under the Mining Act, uh, these permits, the plans, the proposals would be posted to the Environmental Registry. You would have a 30-day comment period. And then you would also expect that down the road, they would, the proponent would apply for environmental compliance approvals. Those ECAs would also be posted to the Environmental Registry for, for comments. And so it would be publicly available. Um, but again, <laughs> the early exploration mining hasn't happened under the Mining Act even though the activities on their, on their face look the same. Um, so we don't have access to that. Um, that's why I was pointing you to the MOU and the agreements, and that kind of sets out the, the detail that we do have. Um, and again, had these activities been overseen by the Ministry of uh, Northern Development and Mines, sorry, I think they're now called the Ministry of Energy, Northern Development and Mines, um, it would also be under uh, maybe some of you are familiar with it. So um, OGS Earth, it's, it's um, a layover on Google Earth that allows you to track um, various mining data, abandoned mine sites, borehole sites. Um, there's a lot of data and um, it, it's actually quite enjoyable to look through. Uh, but again, that's if you fall under the Ministry of uh, Northern Development and Mines. And MMDM also has a really cool site. Again, it's overlaid on Google Earth that allows you to look at drill holes. Um, I did review this map uh, feature and I, I could not find any of the drill holes uh, for Ignace, like the ones we know that have been drilled, I could not find them uh, on this map feature. Lastly, so at the very beginning of my presentation, I did mention that a lot of the info we have about um, the status of the projects, the status of the activities and what's going on came from the meeting minutes of the community liaison committees. So here's the link to each of those CLCs um, if you want to follow them, if you want to um, read them yourselves. And that is the end of my presentation. So I'll stop it there. Um, this presentation will be posted in full to our website, sila.ca. Um, you can email me, carrie at sila.ca if you uh, have questions and you don't want to ask them publicly. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, the link once I post the publicate uh, the presentation you can click on the, the Twitter symbol and, and it'll redirect to my Twitter page uh, and yeah I will stop there um, we have time for questions I can always go back and uh, clarify information so okay. thank you very much oh, you great that was really helpful um, Lots of information and um, we'll start, we've got a couple of questions or a, a comment and then a question from Meg uh, on the chat line and then I'll, I'll keep an eye. I've now uh, changed the settings so that you are able to mute and unmute yourself uh, at this point. So I'll start with Meg's question from the chat and then we'll have a look at the participants list and go back and forth that way. Um, so Meg had made a comment uh, mid-presentation about groundwater uh, and some issues uh, where uh, people in the past have had contaminated drinking water, have contaminated the drinking water aquifer um, through uh, using uh, when people uh, drill for warm water for heat pumps. So just a, a comment about some of those cross connections that happen when you drill at depth. Now, Meg uh, also commented, it's good that they're supposed to seal off different hydrological zones. Uh, will there be an evaluation of groundwater used by people in the area? And if it's even an issue. Um, so. Yeah, sure. So in the NWO documents, they're not um, specific uh, regarding the type of environmental monitoring that's going on, but they just say that in 
compliance with provincial regulations, they will be monitoring uh, the emissions from the site. Um, I, I can add in, I think that NWMO in their initial screening, which was step two, um, they actually did uh, reportedly screen out what they called potable water, which would be um, the groundwater here in the vicinity. Now the Rebel Lake area is a, is a um, you know, it's a, it, 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 it's a rural area. It's a, it's a, Areas. So there are not actually immediate vicinity of the drill zones uh, uh, groundwater users uh, um, in the nobody has drilled wells for 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 drinking water or potable water in that location but I think the other issues that you raised Meg around just potential for Cross contamination of aquifers um, uh, is, is, you know, that's sort of an always an ever present concern in drilling operations, both for mineral exploration uh, and for, um, in this instance, uh, the NWMO's intentions. So I've got my eye on the participants list and chat function to see if there's any hands raised or mics being opened or questions in the chat. And if not, you're at risk of my adding a comment <laughs> and maybe I'll just go and do that. I wanted to add in, so the permission, so what are they calling it, Carrie? They're calling it permission submissions. Mm -hmm. so the NWMO has submitted to the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry uh, lengthy documents outlining their request for permission to proceed to drilling. They've done it very quietly. It is there, and we knew of it only through repeated questions to the Ministry of Natural Resources district office in Wawa, who eventually responded with a link to the posting on the NWMO website. And on the NWMO website, and Carrie can speak to this, how many layers down you have to go to actually find these documents. But the status as I understand it is, they submitted that uh, permission submission uh, about, what Carrie, seven or eight months ago. There has never been a public notice of that being there, although it has been mentioned to the CLC. It has been, the CLC is aware of it. I'm not, at least through my reading of the minutes and what I've heard locally, I'm not aware of any explicit invitation for comment, even locally in Manitowoc, uh, Horn Payne, and uh, um, and they have, they do have a requirement. Carrie mentioned that the uh, uh, report on First Nation Indigenous Peoples consultation or engagement has not yet been uh, submitted, at least to, you know, uh, uh, at least that's not uh, publicly available. And I think that's probably very much the case because the First Nations in the Ignace and Manitowoc, in the Horn Pain and Manitowoc area, have stated outright opposition, firm, clear, repeated opposition to the Nuclear Waste Management Organization's activities and presence, and that is Pick River First Nation, uh, Pick Mobert First Nation, and Horn Payne First Nation. So it may take a while for NWMO to get the kind of consultation report um, that they, you know, would be prepared to submit, although they are extending their consultation further out beyond the area of the actual rights holders um, to First Nations, Indigenous organizations, and Métis organizations further afield. So we see, I see we have a question from Gordon Edwards. Um, Gordon asks, has drilling occurred at Horn Pain and Manitowoc? If so, how much? So I will go back. Here's my summary, my summary slide of, um, sorry guys, here we are. Um, so Manitowoc, no, 
it's in the same phase as Ignace and Horn and Payne, but from my reading, and Bernie, you're welcome to, to weigh in on this too, but from my reading of the um, CLC meeting minutes, there hasn't been any activity in Manitowage. It's been um, just Horn, Payne, and Ignace. So the intent is still there for Manitowage, um, but no physical work as of yet. So um, for Horn and Payne, drilling is imminent if it hasn't started already. Um, because they said it would commence late 2018, early 2019, whereas in Ignace, they did already drill um, in, in 2017, and there's more sites currently being drilled. Yeah. So actually in Horn Payne, they have not yet, they still don't, they haven't filed their uh, report on indigenous consultation. That's and true, so that will, yeah. So they don't yet have, to the best of our knowledge, they don't yet have that permit from MNR. Now, of course, the question is, uh, what will be the lag between when MNR issues that and when we actually have that information? There may be a lag, although I expect there are many people in the Horn Payne Manitowoc area who are watching the situation closely. So I think we may be we may get that information. Uh, through uh, through local sources, but it has been granted Horn Payne Manitowoc. And then had this process been publicly available in the environmental registry, you would be able to track the proposal that was made um, or the permit. And then also when a decision was made on it. So, um, and the environmental registry is, is cumbersome itself and not always ideal, but um, at least it is a, a public forum that I think many of us use and um, are aware of, and so there is at least some some traceability and transparency. Great, thanks. Great. So Gordon is also asking, who is the NWMO Indigenous man who is preparing the Indigenous report? He's from Six Nations, I think. How does one get a copy of the Indigenous report when it is available? Um, so I don't know who the contact is. Maybe you do, Bernie, but um, with the Indigenous report, it hasn't, I haven't read that it's going to be made publicly available. Um, I know if this was the Mining Act process, there is a similar um, Aboriginal consultation report that is prepared and that is not made public. So the NWMO, just in answer to the question about who is the Indigenous, uh, NWMO Indigenous person preparing the report, NWMO has been on a pretty constant hire um, for a number of years and they have, Bob Watts is their most long-standing uh, uh, First Nation uh, engagement staff person, and I can't remember where he's from. Um, they've hired Joe Heil, who many will remember from being an Ontario Power Generation uh, staff person during the review for the Deep Geological Repository for Low and Intermediate Level Waste at King Carden. Uh, he is now on hire. Um, they have now hired Arthur Moore from Constance Lake, First Nation. Um, so they've got a number of people uh, hired and working on the file. I'm not sure specifically um, who is uh, working on each of these individuals. They also have people hired from Wapagoon Lake, First Nation. They have another young woman hired from, um, from Bruce County. Uh, so Gordon, I could, we could track in through the CLC minutes. That's the way to see who the indigenous, uh, who has the lead for consultation with indigenous people. And it's often an indigenous person from another territory that NWMO has hired. Um, but that's the easiest way to find out is just look at the CLC minutes. Um, Russell Walker asks, is the indigenous, if the indigenous report is negative, can the drilling still proceed? Carrie, you have a go, then I'll have a go. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually trying to just pull up the agreement. Um, oh, well, I don't have the agreement in front of me, so. Um, <laughs> well, you look for, uh, I'm gonna just make a comment while you look for that, Carrie. So I would say that if the NWMO was going to actually take their responses received in their 
indigenous engagement, and I've got air quotes around indigenous engagement, they would be long gone from these territories because um, there have been very clear statements, both from the, uh, the, 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 the rights holders locally, pick, in the case of Manitowash and Hornpain, it's uh, Pick Mobert, Pick River, and Hornpain First Nations, and also from at a, at a, at a treaty organization level. So I uh, think it will be very interesting, Russell, to see how the NWMO manages uh, the negative response that I, I, I'm pretty confident they'll get, at least in the Manitowage and, uh, and Pick River area. They're working um, very hard, and we've reviewed this in the, in the Canada update, they're working very hard on their, air quote, Indigenous engagement, end air quote, um, program. And you can see that by the number of outreach activities that they are engaged in, going to communities, um, going to various organizations. So that, I think, is going to be very interesting. And Gordon then says, should we not insist that it be made public? I think absolutely, Gordon. And I think uh, now that we have a Northern Services Legal Council, um, uh, maybe one of the things we can ask to put on Carrie's work uh, list is um, doing regular access to information requests. Um, for communications between MNR and uh, the Nuclear Waste Management Organization. Uh, Carrie, did you find that part from the MOU? Yeah. Um, oh, in the MOU. No, I didn't check the MOU. I was okay. checking the agreement between, oh, like, the one. Yeah, and, the, and there's nothing that mentions um, Indigenous engagement. And funny that. And so I, I'll keep checking because I am curious. Maybe it is in the MOU and I can check there too. But just to that point, so even if the Indigenous report is negative, um, that would assume that the Indigenous communities or even more broadly in Canada have um, like a veto right to actually say no to a project and, and we're not there yet. So um, there isn't nation to nation engagement. There isn't, um, well, we are a signatory of UNDRIP, um, which does, uh, require free prior and informed consent. Um, that again is the principle of international law and hasn't fully been integrated into our domestic law. So it, it'll probably be uh, Indigenous reported received and maybe uh, conditions on the permit or conditions on the activities are added. Um, but, but no, I, I can't see it being a full stop. So uh, CJ Hamill has asked, thank you Carrie for that. Uh, CJ Hamill has asked, will the Indigenous report be a single report under the Indian Act colonial process or will hereditary leaders also submit one or more? And I think that's a very good question. Uh, uh, CJ, uh, Carrie, do you want to speak to that? What you found to date? Yeah, so so far the Indigenous report is is a process that's led by the NWMO and their outreach consultations. So um, I, I think you'd have to look at the sufficiency of their consultation that, that is um, ongoing. Um, the UN Rapporteur for Indigenous Rights in Canada um, has repeatedly found that our, our consultation is insufficient. So um, I haven't reviewed this project uh, specifically, but given the systemic uh, lack of, of meaningful uh, consultation and engagement, um, those might be themes we can see um, definitely in this process as well. Um, so at the moment, what it is, the NWO is making an Indigenous report and that gets submitted to the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and the MNRF, when they receive that uh, engagement report, will then say, yes, this can, can move on and the, and the activities that you're proposing, so the borehole drilling, that can now move on. Um, and so until that report gets approved by the MNRF, um, the activities can't proceed. Right, and I'll just add a clarification. The reason, the arrangement here is it's because the Crown has a duty to consult and the Ministry of Natural Resources has delegated that duty to consult to the Nuclear Waste Management Organization. So that's how this report from the NWMO fits into the Ministry of Natural Resources responsibilities and obligations. Um, so Gordon uh, Edwards has asked, uh, has suggested he could request from uh, Grand Chief Hare of Anishinaabek Nation and Grand Chief Joseph Norton of Iroquois Caucus um, 
that they request uh, that report. And I think that would be, I think that would be really helpful, Gordon. I think that um, as much presence uh, on this file, particularly directly from the uh, indigenous organizations is really, really important, really helpful. And it could be at this stage at the report, there might not even be a draft report because there were um, minutes from one of the CLC meetings that said that Indigenous engagement um, and socialization would be ongoing. And um, yeah, it said socialization and socializing would be part of um, it. Yeah, so there's more socializing happening. Um, so whether or not there's even a report to request um, is another question mark. So I'm happy to look at the participants list for open mics. Charles, you have your mic open. Did you have a question? Yeah, yes, Charles? I have a series of questions for Carrie, but I want to let other people go first because I might take up several minutes. Okay, and Charles, these questions are with respect to the Nuclear Waste Management Organization's citing process? Just yes. Okay. Um, go ahead, Charles. Hello, Carrie. <laughs> Uh, my name's Charles Rhodes. I've been involved on and off with the NWMO since about 2008 to 2010. In 2010, I took a proposal from the Canadian mining industry to the NWMO uh, to totally change their course of action, uh, and they simply refused to deal with the mining industry. So that may be part of your introductory uh, issues. Uh, I, I polled the mining industry and there was virtually unanimous agreement that the, by far the best place for storing nuclear waste in Canada is not in Ontario at all. It's in a, a certain volcanic area in British Columbia. The, the merits of that area are that you can store the waste <coughs> over a thousand feet above the water table so that if you, if you store the waste there, uh, there would be no problem with polluting groundwater, uh, assuming you, you pack the stuff up reasonably and ensure drainage. <clears throat> and you'd still be 500 meters under the surface meeting the NWMO requirement for uh, glacier or glaciation protection. In uh, later years, I became aware of something known as the Ottensmeyer Plan for reprocessing waste. And uh, without getting into the technical complexities too far. Hey, Charles, I'm going to remind you that this webinar is not about Ottenmeyer's reprocessing ideas. Uh, it's about the NWMO's uh, uh, site exploration. The issue is that there is no legitimate scientific motivation for drilling at all. And, and I do not know the approval process, but it, do they have to have a legitimate motivation for doing the drilling uh, to start with? Um, well, and I think that does play in a little bit. So if the motivation was for, um, I'm gonna flip to it in my, in my slide. So the purpose, let's say it was like a Mining Act thing. So the purpose of the Mining Act is to encourage prospecting, mining claims, exploration and development of mineral resources. So if that was the motivation, these activities would probably fall under the Mining Act. But again, the motivation is not to develop mineral resources, which is why it's not in the Mining Act, it's not under MMDM. Um, Typically, yes, exploration for borehole drilling would fall, the majority of the time, would fall in uh, within the, the scope of the Mining Act and, and developing mineral resources, but, and this isn't, that's not the motivation. So that's actually a key point in this instance is what is the end product or the use of, of the drilling that's occurring? So I, I think, Charles, you do raise a good point about what their motivation is. and. And I'll, I'll, I'll just contribute to the conversation to say 
their motivation is that they lined, set out a nine step process to get to an approval. They want, and I think this is an area where you and I may have agreement, Charles, that their motivation is not necessarily sincerely to find out about these rock formations and their, you know, and their characteristics, which is their stated purpose. Their purpose is that it is part of a nine step process they're going through to get to what they believe is an, is an inevitable approval for a geological repository for the burial of all of Canada's high level radioactive waste. And I'd like to, to get to that further, that we dispute the nine step process uh, as being not only invalid, but contrary to Canada's international commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So, so I, I, again, it comes to motivation and it, come, it comes to this nine step process that doesn't, uh, doesn't seem to be founded in uh, scientific or engineering reality. Yeah, I, I think I, I think we can agree on that, Charles, for certain. I think that what I would describe the NWMO approach as saying we cannot the 1977 deep waste burial concept, and they are now holding science and social information to try and accommodate that. I'm having difficulty understanding you. Somebody's got an open mic somewhere. It's putting a lot of noise on the line. That's better. Okay. I'm sorry, could you just repeat what you just said? I, I couldn't hear you. I, I, I would summarize the NWMO approach as they uh, picked up the 1977 concept from the Hare Report of burying nuclear waste and they are now in the third round of trying to mold science, scientific and social information to try and accommodate that. And that's what their nine step process is about. And it's, it's the engineering in it is, is social engineering. Um, so I, I think, but that is, that is unfortunately, we uh, made those arguments in 2002 and were not successful. Uh, when the federal government passed the Nuclear Fuel Waste Act. And we've made, uh, not to say that we shouldn't keep making those arguments, I think we should. Um, but uh, I think that, I think, you're, I think your assessment is right that the NWMO process has a, um, uh, you know, doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't have the kind of, um, sincerity uh, that uh, would be required. Okay, d d uh, d I'll just leave it, I'll turn, close my mic, but I'll ask Carrie if she has any knowledge of law that might be relevant to this issue. Hi, so sorry, it was my, my mic that was picking up all the, the extra noise. Um, so my background uh, with Sila, I've been there for about three years now. Um, uh, I, I do come from an energy background. My master's, I studied offshore oil um, and, and looking at the regulation of um, offshore oil in the North Sea and off the coast of Newfoundland in particular. And then when I joined CELA, um, I do a lot of nuclear work. It's been mainly around the, the, the relicensing of nuclear power plants. Uh, it's only been in the last year or so that I've been getting more into um, the flip side of, of relicensing nuclear power plants, which is um, what to do with the waste. So that, um, uh, and, and we have been working with communities in the Northwest around um, the, the waste projects, so. Great, thank you. Cal, Cal. Cal. Hello. Hello, I don't know if this is on or not. It is, we can hear you fine, thank you. Okay, legally speaking, let's assume that it goes to the end and there is a site chosen and it's in Northern Ontario and there's nothing anyone could do about it. 
legally speaking, how can you be assured that only Canadian waste ends up at that site? Is there anything to stop other, other uh, sources of nuclear waste coming to Canada? Gary, do you want to have a go at that? Sure. So um, I, ha I didn't review that, that specific uh, point for this presentation, um, but I will say that uh, the government, the federal government, uh, and also recently, just yesterday, the province of Ontario has has shown its support for small modular reactors. So if, if we look at novel waste sources from new reactor sources that weren't part of um, the NWMO's review in the early 2000s when it first engaged in its consultations around um, how to store waste, we are seeing new waste streams possibly being um, put into this existing process. Um, so whether it's from outside of Canada, I, I'm not, I can't speak to that, but I think we are already seeing that um, the scope of the review that was first done when the NWMO was set up is, is, is changing if, if SMRs were to be developed in Canada. So there is um, an expansion in um, the potential waste that could be housed at these sites and, and the characteristics of that yet unknown. And I can add to that, Cal, um, in 2002, when the act was uh, under review, um, that was an issue that was raised by Northwatch, by Canadian Environmental Law Association and by Nuclear Awareness Project, particularly. Uh, and we raised it as part of the review. We raised it as part uh, during the standing committee uh, hearings on the Nuclear Fuel Waste Act. Uh, it was, um, <clears throat> argued uh, by the block that there needed to be amendments to the act to, pre to state specifically that uh, foreign waste would be excluded and the Liberal government at that time uh, refused to make that amendment. So there's no protection in the act itself against foreign waste. In 2000, I think it was 2011, um, when communities were in step two, um, Canadian Environmental Law Association did a legal opinion for us on, on trade issues more generally related to the Nuclear Fuel Waste Act. <clears throat> and, um, and the NWMO also, uh, I think, had a, a, about a two-page backgrounder paper. And the outcome was that we were, the, the, the net conclusion is that Canada is vulnerable to imports of foreign waste because of certain provisions under the North American Free Trade Agreement now, it would be interesting to go back and look at it again now that that agreement has been changed. And more generally, because waste is considered a good uh, and goods and services uh, under, the, under NAFTA, there, was, there had to be equal access across the border. So I think that it is a, I, I don't think that we should assume even though the NWMO always says it's for Canada's irradiated fuel. Actually, they don't say irradiated, they for Canada's um, uh, fuel waste. Um, I don't think we should assume that it is not, uh, the borders would not be open. Um, we've got a note from Gordon in the Zoom, uh, Zoom chat. Um, that uh, he can send if people want to email him at ccnr at web.ca. Uh, he has some good resources, background resources on uh, nuclear waste and reprocessing. So I think we're at our one hour mark. I'm going to zoom up and down the line. I don't see, I see uh, Cal's hand raised, but I think that's still from before. Uh, Cal, if you had another comment. Um, Hearing none, I don't see anything else in the group chat. So I think we'll call it a wrap. Uh, so any final comments, Carrie, before we close off? Um, no final comments, but if you do want the, uh, the PowerPoint, it will be posted at the CELA website likely tomorrow. So CELA.ca, um, it'll be posted there. And maybe Bernane, if I send you the link, you can circulate it to um, the members as well who joined today. And uh, if there's any questions you have or any links in particular you would like, you can email me directly, Carrie at Sela.ca, K-E-R-R-I-E. Um, yeah, and thank you everyone for um, taking time out of your Thursday midday to, to join in. Okay, and thank you very much, Carrie, and thank you all for joining us. And uh, you will get a follow-up email uh, with, uh, with the links that, um, 
uh, Carrie and uh, Gordon have offered. So thanks very much. We'll see you next Thursday at a uh, presentation mm -hmm. with um, Dr. Ramana on small modular reactors. Thanks so much. <laughs>